Boldwood presents Christmas Wishes at the Chocolate Shop, A Tale of Two Christmases, written by Jessica Redland and read by Emma Swan. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One Goodbye, Nana, I whispered turning in a circle and scattering her ashes across the sand dunes. You're with your wildlife now. And Grandpa. Spurn Point Nature Reserve, a three-mile-long peninsula curving between the North Sea and Humber Estuary, had been my grandparents' favourite place, and it wasn't hard to see why. On a sunny August day like today, when the bluey-green sea was calm, I felt like I was on an island in the middle of nowhere rather than 25 miles east of Hull. I watched the dust settle among the sand and grasses, exactly as Nana had wanted. A tear slipped down my cheek, and I quickly swiped at it because that's exactly what Nana hadn't wanted. I could imagine her whispering in my ear, Come on now, Charlie lovey, turn the tap off. Crying won't bring me back. I couldn't help it, though. I missed them both so much. After my mother, Stacy, abandoned me the day I was born, my grandparents had brought me up. So losing Grandpa five years ago and Nana in May had felt like a double impact each time. Grandparent and parent rolled into one. Sitting down on a nearby sand dune, I closed my eyes and let the mid-afternoon sun kiss my face. Such a beautiful day. Nana would have loved it. If cancer hadn't taken her, she'd have been sitting beside me enthusiastically identifying the birds and wildflowers. But she wasn't here, and never would be again. At the start of April, the doctors had given her a week, two at the most. I knew that she was desperate to celebrate my 30th birthday on the 1st of May. I also knew that she was tired, in pain, and ready to be reunited with Grandpa. Holding her frail hand in the hospice as she drifted in and out of consciousness, I whispered that it was okay to leave, but somehow she hung in there and made it through my milestone birthday, just dying at 1.08am on the 2nd of May, with me by her side. I don't think I've ever known another couple quite as devoted as my grandparents. All my memories of them together were happy, giggling as they prepared a meal, holding hands everywhere they went, slow dancing in the lounge when they thought I'd gone to bed. Nana had quite literally fallen for the boy next door. Grandpa had moved in when he was ten and had invited her to help him build a den in the woods. They'd been inseparable for the next seventy-two years, until a fatal heart attack stole him from us. A true gent to the core, he'd been adored by everyone who met him but he only had eyes for Nana. It was my forever wish to be fortunate enough to find a love like theirs. Perhaps I'd already found it with Ricky. After nearly six months together, I knew I was smitten and couldn't imagine my life without him, but I was aware it was still early days. A terminally ill grandparent hadn't exactly provided the backdrop for a happy, carefree start to our relationship, although him not ditching me in favour of someone with less emotional baggage suggested he might feel the same way about me. Charlie. I snapped open my eyes and looked in the direction of the shout, shielding my eyes against the bright sun. Ricky? He ran across the sand, waving. I thought you couldn't make it. Heart racing, I picked up my bag and the urn and ran down the sand dune into his embrace. Biffo's finishing up. It's about time he pulled his weight, lazy git. I didn't want you to have to do this on your own. I'm not too late, am I? I pulled away and held up the empty urn. He grimaced. Sorry, how was it? A bit emotional, but... My voice cracked and tears welled in my eyes. Ricky put his arms round me again and pulled me close as I sobbed against his chest. At six feet tall, with strong muscles from his work as a joiner and labourer, his hugs were powerful and comforting. I always felt like I could face anything after a Ricky hug. Sorry, I said when I'd calmed down. 
Since we met, all I seem to have done is cry on you. I'd met Ricky in late February while out celebrating my best friend Jody's 30th birthday. He'd been on a stag do pub crawl in Hull City Centre, but the pubs hadn't been welcoming of a large all-male group, so the men offered our small group a couple of free rounds if we accompanied them and made the group mixed. I was attracted to Ricky instantly, with his dark blonde hair in a buzz-cut style, twinkly blue eyes and high cheekbones, he reminded me of Brad Pitt in his younger days. When Ricky took my number at the end of the evening, I genuinely hadn't expected to hear from him, but he rang a couple of days later and took me out for a meal the following night. The first five weeks together were fantastic. Ricky was interesting, fun and attentive, and I could easily see myself falling for him. But suddenly, I had something different to focus on. Nana was admitted to hospital, then moved to the hospice after her devastating prognosis. What sort of boyfriend would I be if I ran off when things got tricky? Come here, you. He wiped my tears, then cupped my face in his hands, his eyes fixed on mine for a moment, before tenderly kissing me. His hands moved into my hair as the kiss deepened, making my heart race again. I moaned softly as his hands shifted to down my back and then up inside my T-shirt, gently grazing the sides of my breasts. A momentary fizz of excitement gave way to annoyance and I stepped away, frowning. Had he just tried to feel me up today of all days? Come on, Charlie, he said, his voice husky and full of longing. There's nobody around. You know I can't resist you. He moved in for another kiss, but I took a further step away. I know, and I'm really flattered, but it's not really the time or place, is it? I held up Nana's urn to illustrate my point, but it was hard to keep my tone light and not add. Show some respect. He nodded. Sorry, I should have thought. Forgive me? I relaxed my shoulders, unable to resist those puppy dog eyes. It's okay. I'm just a bit emotional today. I rolled my eyes. A bit more emotional than usual, that is. I took his hand in mine. Thanks for being so patient with me. I know I've not exactly been the dream girlfriend, crying all the time and squirming at the thought of having sex in my grandparents' house, but I'll make it up to you. I had a serious amount of making up to do. We had slept together, but it hadn't been a regular thing. To save money to pay off his credit card debts, Ricky had been sleeping rent-free on his workmate Biffo's sofa, so staying over at his wasn't an option. Before Nana took a turn for the worst, he'd slept over at ours a couple of times. She'd insisted on him sleeping in my room, saying she wasn't completely naive about modern-day relationships, but I'd far rather she'd banished him to the third bedroom. The thought of having sex while Nana slept, or tried to sleep, in the room next door made me shudder. After Nana died, I assumed the discomfort would go, but it hadn't so far. My strategy was either avoiding intimacy altogether, or lying back, crossing my fingers and faking it. I wasn't proud of myself. Tonight? Ricky asked, sounding hopeful. We'll see. I put the urn in my bag, thankful I could turn away in case my expression gave away how I really felt about the prospect. Hand in hand, we ambled towards Spurn Point, the tip of the sand pit. Biffo asked when you want to do the big refurb. He's been asked to plaster his brother's house and he doesn't want to book that in if you need us to gut your place first. I sighed. Making the decision to refurbish my grandparents' home had caused me several sleepless nights. It desperately needed bringing into the 21st century, but I felt guilty about changing all the things that Nana and Grandpa had chosen. They'd loved that house, and it was so them. It wasn't me, though. I'm still not sure what to do. Mr. Winters came round again last night. He's desperate to buy it for his daughter. I'm wondering whether I should sell it to him and buy somewhere that's more me. Sell it? Since when? When I suggested it, you were adamant you weren't going to move. He sounded a little put out, and I could understand that. I had been adamant at the time, but my neighbour, Mr Winters, had made a good point. If I was planning to refurbish it, it wouldn't look like my grandparents' home anymore. So was selling up and moving to a new home that much different? I know, and 
I was determined to stay at the time, but I'm having doubts. The house needs a lot of work, and I don't know if I can bring myself to have it gutted. It might be easier and less painful to cut the ties completely, sell up and buy somewhere new with the proceeds. We continued in silence for several minutes before Ricky spoke. I think you should sell, and my logic for that is that you're not comfortable there. Even when your nana was alive, you always acted as though you were a lodger. I thought you'd be different after she died, but nothing's changed. You're still tense. He looked at me pointedly. Did he know that I'd been faking? I think you need a fresh start. Reaching the point, we sat down on the bench facing each other. I scooped up some warm sand and let it trickle through my fingers as I took in the stunning view. To my left was the sea, twinkling deep blue and turquoise in the sunshine. To my right, I could see back along the peninsula to the low lighthouse on the beach and the high black and white striped lighthouse in the grassy dunes. I could hear birds and insects and smell salt in the air. Have I upset you by saying that? Ricky asked, raking his hands back and forth through the sand. I shook my head. No, it's just a lot to think about. You're right, though. It doesn't feel like my home anymore. Growing up, it had felt every bit my home, but I'd moved out when I was 20 to share a flat with Jodie. I'd always known that living with my best friend wouldn't be a forever arrangement. Sure enough, after four amazing years together, it was time for her to move in with her long-term boyfriend, Carl. Unable to find another affordable flat within a short commute to work, I moved back in with my grandparents. It was only meant to be temporary, but within a year, Grandpa died, and Nana seemed to age a decade overnight. She kept telling me that there was no rush to move out, and I knew her well enough to realise that was her way of asking me to stay. So I did, but I felt like the lodger. It wasn't anything she said or did. It was all completely in my head, but I knew I wasn't settled. So, what are you going to do? Ricky asked. Sell to Mr Winters, I think. Should I? He picked up a pebble and tossed it into the sea, then turned to face me. Yes, because it would be quick and easy, but only if he gives you a good price. I'd get a few estate agents in to value it first, because houses like that are in demand, even when they need work. But only if selling is what you really want. It's your decision. He brushed the sand off his hands, then took my hand in his and fixed his eyes on mine. Sell or stay. I'll still love you. My eyes widened. He loved me. He'd never said that before. I studied his earnest expression and kicked myself. I was being silly. It was just a turn of phrase. It didn't mean he actually loved me, did it? Ricky ran his thumb over my hand. Did you hear what I just said, Charlie? His voice was gentle, and he looked a little uncertain of himself, which was adorable. My heart raced. Yes, I did, but I wasn't sure if... He smiled as I tailed off. I did mean it. I love you, Charlie. I'm sorry I haven't said it sooner, but there never seemed a right moment. I'm not sure this is it either, but it kind of slipped out. I knew I adored him, but at that moment, I realised it was more than that. I'd fallen in love for the very first time. He'd been my rock for the past six months, and I wanted him in my life forever. I love you too, Ricky. He leaned forward and tenderly kissed me, and this time he didn't push for more. We lay back on the sand, hands clasped, staring up at the sky. The wispiest of clouds, like tiny sections of aeroplane trails, were the only break in the bright cornflower blue. I thought about what Ricky and I had just said to each other, and the patience and understanding he'd shown me, and an idea took hold. I wasn't an impulsive person, but occasionally an idea presented itself out of the blue that felt so right that I had to act on it immediately. It was a big step, and one I'd never come close to taking before. Butterflies fluttered in my stomach as I tried to find the best way to say it. I drew strength from Ricky's hand squeezing mine and rolled onto my side. I have something to ask you. Ricky adjusted his position to face me. Ask away. 
It may only be for a short while, given the conversation we've just had about me selling up, but I was wondering... I paused, trying to get control of my nerves so that my voice wouldn't wobble. I was wondering if you'd like to move in with me. His eyes lit up. You mean that? It's got to be better than sleeping on Biffo's sofa, surrounded by empty lager cans and his dirty undies. It'll still be rent-free, of course. Ricky laughed. If I say yes, you know that it won't be for those reasons, don't you? It'll be because I want to be with you. I nodded. In that case, it's a yes. When? Now? He grinned, then hugged me tightly. Thank you so much. Should we go and get my stuff right away and then go somewhere to celebrate? The butterflies fluttered in my stomach for a different reason now, and my cheeks coloured as I said, How about we go home to celebrate first, then we get your stuff? Ricky stood up and reached out a hand to help me to my feet. Well, when you put it like that. As our naked bodies entwined on the lounge rug an hour later, I had to keep telling myself to relax and enjoy the moment. I knew I was sexually compatible with Ricky because we'd been away for his birthday and it had been fantastic, but I simply couldn't relax in my grandparents' home. I wasn't sure whether it was because it felt disrespectful or whether I half expected one of them to walk in on us. Ricky's fingers and his tongue worked with expert precision, yet I had to fake it again. We lay on our sides facing each other. He gently ran his hand down the curve of my body. Am I doing something wrong? I gulped. No, of course not. Why do you ask? Charlie, you know you like an open book. Busted. He did know. It's not you. It's just... It's just this place, isn't it? As I said earlier, you're not comfortable here, and I don't think that's going to change. I wrinkled my nose. Sorry, I know. I can't live like this, can I? I'll call some estate agents in the morning. I think you should, but only if you're sure. I'm sure. I need to be in my own home, not my grandparents. Or rather, we need to be in our own home. Chapter 2 Hi, gorgeous. I'm back. Ricky poked his head round the lounge door a couple of evenings later, and his smile slipped. I didn't know we were expecting visitors. It's okay. I was leaving. Mr. Winters took the last glug of tea, put his mug down on a crocheted doily on the occasional table beside him, and stood up. I'll be in touch again as soon as I've briefed my solicitor. Pleasure doing business with you. He shook my hand, smiling. And you, Mr. Winters. Stop it, Charlie. He pretended to look stern, then broke into a grin. It's Neil. Mr. Winters makes me sound like a teacher. I laughed as I realised how ridiculous it was calling him by his title, considering he was only about five years older than me. Sorry, Neil, Nana referred to all the neighbours as Mr. or Mrs., even her best friends, and it's a habit now. I'll see you out. I glanced at Ricky loitering in the doorway. He stepped aside, and the two men nodded at each other, but didn't speak. I remembered my manners. Neil, this is my boyfriend, Ricky. Ricky, this is Neil. We've just agreed a deal on the house sale. So I gather. He folded his arms and raised his eyebrows at Neil. I hope you haven't tried to pull a swift one. I flinched at his hard tone and the rudeness of the comment. Ricky! They stared at each other for a moment, like stags sizing up the competition before locking antlers. Then Neil turned and headed for the door while Ricky pushed past me into the lounge. I'm sorry about that, I muttered as Neil stepped outside. He shrugged. Don't worry about it. It's good that you've got someone looking out for you. I thought you said he was buying the house for his daughter. Ricky snapped when I returned to the lounge. He is. An investment for when she's older. No, it's for now. She's 18 and getting married this summer. His body seemed to relax and his tone softened. He's got an 18-year-old daughter. Really? He doesn't look much older than us. I leaned against the doorframe, smiling. I'd intended to have words with him about his rudeness towards Neil, but instead found myself amused by what I could now clearly see as insecurity and jealousy. He isn't. Nana said he became a dad when he was 18, so he'll be about 36 now. You're not jealous, are you? Ricky stiffened. No, 
Should I be? Not at all, but you are. You're so jealous. You assumed Neil would be in his 50s or 60s instead of young and hot, didn't you? He narrowed his eyes. You think he's hot? Of course not. And even if I did, which I don't, he's very, very happily married. And you know my views on infidelity. It wasn't something I'd personally experienced, but I'd been there to support Jodie a couple of years ago after she discovered that before she'd moved in with Carl, he'd been with several other women. What a dickhead. They'd been together since they were 14, so that was a 14-year relationship flushed down the toilet because he felt there was something he needed to get out of his system before settling down in a monogamous relationship. Like Jodie, I'd never, ever forgive anyone who did that to me. I knelt on the carpet in front of Ricky. Do you know who I think is hot? I asked in a teasing voice. No idea. It was so hard not to laugh at his gruff voice and petulant expression. I unfastened the belt on his jeans. Do you know who I think is really hot? The corners of his mouth twitched slightly. Ha! I knew he couldn't keep sulking for long. It was cute, though, and reassuring to see that he had a flaw after he'd been pretty much perfect over the past six months. No, he said, his tone lighter, trying not to keel over with embarrassment because being forward so wasn't me. I undid his zipper and pulled his jeans open. Do you know who I think is really, really hot? No, who? I seductively licked my tongue across my lips. That bloke who presents the weather on the local news. Ricky laughed. Sorry for being grumpy. Crap day. Yes, but I'll tell you about it in a minute. I arched my eyebrows. A minute? Is that all it's going to take? Two then, he said, lunging for me as I squealed. So why did you have a crap day? I asked serving up a dish of pasta an hour or so later and sitting down at the dining table opposite Ricky. Nana had always insisted on proper sit-down meals in the dining room, another habit I hadn't yet broken. Ricky stabbed at a couple of pieces of fusilli with his fork and sighed. Big announcement at work today. House sales are slower than predicted. They've put phase three on hold. No, how long for? He sighed again and shoved the pasta into his mouth. Indefinitely. My heart sank for him. I'd always thought that Tenley Meadows was a ridiculously ambitious project. 1,650 new homes, a school, doctor's surgery, shops, pub and other amenities situated northeast of Hull. It wasn't the best location for commuting into the city centre. There weren't enough jobs in that immediate area to justify so many houses and the area was prone to flooding. Of course, I'd never voiced my concerns when Ricky secured a contract as one of the joiners on site shortly after we met, focusing instead on the great news at getting a long-term contract. Only it now looked like it wasn't going to be long-term after all. Do you know how long you have left? They're not even going to finish phase two, so they reckon maybe a month, six weeks at a push. He stabbed at his fusilli again. Oh, Ricky, that's crap, he nodded. What are you going to do? I'll have to find another contract. One of my mates reckons they need more joiners on the housing estate where he's working. He didn't sound too enthusiastic, presumably still reeling from the bad news, so I injected as much enthusiasm into my voice as I could. That's brilliant news. Is he going to put in a good word for you? He will if I ask him to. He reckons I could start immediately too. Even better, in case they mess you around at Tenley Meadows. Which development is it? It's called Lower Glendale. I pondered for a moment. It didn't sound familiar. Is that the one near North Ferriby? Ricky put his fork down and sighed. No, it's in Whitsborough Bay. I stopped, fork full of pasta midway to my mouth, and stared at him, my stomach churning. The North Yorkshire seaside town of Whitsborough Bay was where Ricky had been brought up and where his best mate Smurf still lived. It was only the next county, but it was a 90-minute drive north from where I lived in Brockington near Hull, and that was on a good day. With single-track roads all the way, the travel time could easily increase. Smurf was the mate who told me about it, he continued, his tone flat, his expression apologetic. Say something. Sorry, I... 
I put my fork down and pushed my bowl aside, appetite gone. You're going to take it, aren't you? I asked in a small voice, knowing that he didn't have much choice as he couldn't not work. I'm going to have to. I made some calls this afternoon and there's nothing round here at the moment. I moved to Hull because there were no jobs in Whitsborough Bay, but the work's dried up here and typically there's plenty of work back home. Then you should ring Smurf and tell him you're interested before someone else secures it. I tried to sound cheerful, but it wasn't easy. Don't look so sad, Ricky said. It doesn't mean things have to change between us, you know. I still want to be with you. I know it's not ideal, but it's not the other side of the country. It's only the next county. We can make the distance thing work. Assuming you want to, that is. Of course I do. Ricky came to my side of the table and put his arms round me. I snuggled against his stomach, my arms round his waist. You could always move to Whitsborough Bay with me, he said, stroking my hair. I can't do that. Why not? You're selling this place and you don't have any family here now. I'm sure that you and Jodie will still see each other wherever you live, especially if you live in Whitsborough Bay. She loves it there, doesn't she? It's her favourite place. She'd be a constant visitor. But I still can't move there, Ricky. My job's here. So find a new job in Whitsborough Bay or take some time out. It's not like you'll be strapped for cash after this place sells. I wasn't strapped for cash now as my grandparents hadn't lived an extravagant lifestyle, leaving me a sizable inheritance. But moved to Whitsborough Bay. I didn't know anyone there. Not that I knew many people in Hull either. Jodie was the only friend I regularly saw out of work. I occasionally went out for a meal with my boss, Pierre, and his wife, Lillian, but that was it. It wasn't like I'd be leaving behind a big circle of friends and a busy social life. I don't know. I said, pulling away from him. Ricky crouched on the floor beside me. It's not a definite no, then. I couldn't help but smile at his eager expression. It's an I'll think about it, but please don't get your hopes up. I love my job, and I have an amazing boss. Who has an evil daughter who likes to make your life hell? Yes, but I only have to work with Gabby twice a week. You wouldn't have to work with her ever again if you moved to Whitsborough Bay with me. A world without Gabby. A delicious thought. It's tempting, but Grandpa set up that business. I know he sold it to Pierre when he retired, but I still think of it as Grandpa's chocolatery. I couldn't imagine selling his home and leaving his business. You could always set up your own chocolate shop in Whitsborough Bay in his memory. I bet you'd do really well. I leaned forward and gently kissed him. You've thought all this through, haven't you? I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you either. I kissed him again. But I don't think I can leave Hull. Not yet. It's too much change all at once. Ricky nodded. I understand. But here's a thought. How old is Pierre? Sixty-five? Do you think he's going to keep working forever? What if he decides to retire? You think it's hell working with Gabby twice a week? Imagine if she was your boss. I shuddered and my stomach lurched at the thought. Pierre was so passionate about his craft that it was easy to assume he'd never step away, but he had to at some point. There was no way Lillian would accept him working forever. The baton would pass to Gabby when he retired, and there was no way I could work for that woman. Although I suspected her first decision as the new owner would be to take great delight in giving me my marching orders. I took in Ricky's eager expression and ruffled his hair. Go on, phone Smurf and get that job secured. We'll work out the distance thing somehow and I'll think about what you've said about moving, but I'm not promising anything. As I listened to him talking animatedly in the hallway, I felt excited for him, but apprehensive for us. Even though he'd said he loved me, was our fledgling relationship strong enough to survive that distance? Would he still want to come back to Hull to see me when he was finally back where he'd always wanted to be, among his family and friends? It would be so much easier for us if I did live in Whitsborough Bay. But that was an enormous decision, and one I wasn't ready to make yet. I'd never lived anywhere else. I'd never even considered it. Moving out of my childhood home was scary enough. Could I really leave my home, my job? and the people I knew to settle in a town I'd only visited a couple of times as a child. 
Chapter Three I stood in the middle of the lounge the following morning, feeling quite overwhelmed at the speed of change. Ricky had left for his final day at work at Tenley Meadows a short while earlier. Final day? It all seemed so quick. Smith had wasted no time following their conversation and had got straight on to his boss, who'd phoned Ricky half an hour later and, after a quick chat, offered him a job on the Lower Glendale development starting on Monday. Ricky had then called his boss, who'd agreed that he could leave with only a day's notice. I suppose it made sense when they were planning to lay them all off, but it all seemed very real very quickly. In the space of four days, he'd moved in, lost his job, found a new one, and was going to be moving out again. I'd scattered Nana's ashes and agreed to sell her house. I could scarcely catch my breath. Turning in a slow circle, I took in the furniture and possessions that epitomised Nana and Grandpa. The mahogany sideboard displayed Nana's posh Royal Dalton dinner service and her cut crystal glasses. The matching tall bookcase was stuffed full of the historical romance novels she'd loved to read. I wandered over to it and ran my fingertips along the spines. She'd spent many an evening in the armchair, paperback in hand her changing facial expressions telling the tale of what she was reading. I'd read most of them myself, too, enraptured by smouldering heroes in frilly shirts and riding breeches. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. It was going to be hard to leave, but I'd made the right decision. Definitely. And if I was moving out, I was going to need to bite the bullet and clear the house, preferably starting today while I was still off work but I had no idea where to start. Wandering into the kitchen, I made a cup of tea instead. I wasn't thirsty, but any opportunity to delay the sorting was most welcome. Returning to the lounge, mug in hand, I looked at the bookshelves again. I'd start there, clearing out all the books I'd read. Easy. I reached for the first book, but I hadn't read it, so left it where it was. The second didn't seem familiar either, and the third was one of Nana's favourites. By the time I made it to the end of the shelf of roughly 40 books, I'd only removed one, a 10-year-old edition of B&Bs in Cornwall. There was no point continuing. I needed to be ruthless, and I wasn't sure I could be. Jodie wasn't one for sentimentality, so I texted her to see if she could help later. Upstairs, in Nana's bedroom, I opened her wardrobe door and lightly ran my fingers across the dresses, predominantly in delicate floral prints and the rainbow of silk blouses. Her perfume wafted at me as the clothes swayed on their hangers, and I could almost feel her presence. A lump formed in my throat as I pictured Nana dressed in her favourite clothes and outfits she'd worn for special occasions. I shook my head and closed the door. Too hard. I definitely needed Jodie by my side for sorting through clothes. There had to be something I could organise that wouldn't be difficult or upsetting. Twenty minutes later, I'd stuffed the entire contents of the airing cupboard, Nana's linens and towels as well as my own, into several bin bags. I'd had the same towels and bedding since I moved out, and it was time for a proper fresh start. Feeling a sense of achievement, I decided to tackle the attic next. The Christmas decorations seemed as good a place as any to start. Nana had loved Christmas. She'd insisted on a real tree each year in the bay window of the lounge with a colour theme, usually silver or gold and one or two other colours, although it was a case of anything goes for the small artificial tree in the dining room for Grandpa, who'd believed that trees should be decorated with an explosion of colour. The decorations were packed into crates, each clearly labelled by colour. I lifted the lid off the first of two red and cream crates and smiled full of material and felt animals and shapes, as well as more traditional baubles. It was my favourite set and looked stunning, accompanied with gold decorations. She'd done that last year. Back then, I'd had no idea it would be our last Christmas together. I pictured her unwrapping her gifts from me, spraying herself with opium eau de toilette, a fragrance I'd always associate with Nana, and snuggling into her new soft grey cardigan. She'd smiled and thanked me, told me I'd spent far too much as usual, then had glanced at Grandpa's photo on the mantelpiece, eyes sparkling. 
had she known back then that she'd soon be joining him. The lump in my throat had returned and I blinked back my tears as I replaced the lid and pushed the crate aside to start a keep pile. The next crate was simply labelled blue, filled with baubles, snowflakes and wooden decorations in navy, royal and pale blue. I loved that colour scheme too. In fact, I loved them all and I knew for a fact that none of the boxes contained old tatty decorations because Nana always took such pride in her tree, so they really didn't need sorting out. There were ten colour-themed crates in total, a box containing the artificial tree for the dining room, a couple of bags for life containing tree lights, plus a further crate with miscellaneous items like the hooks for hanging up wreaths, card holders, spare Christmas cards and tree hooks. That was a lot of Christmas decorations but there was no way I could let any of them go, considering how much Nana and Grandpa had loved Christmas. Plus, they'd get used. I'd never need to buy another decoration in my life. A couple of cardboard boxes stood behind where the crates had been. There was nothing written on the lid of either of them. Crouching down, I opened the flaps on the first one. Inside were another two smaller cardboard boxes. I lifted the first one out and smiled at the words in marker pen on the lid. Charlie's creations. Surely she hadn't kept everything I'd made at school. Peering into the box, it seemed she had. From a cotton wool covered toilet roll tube, which I'm assuming was meant to be a snowman, to an impressive looking angel made from what looked to be a folded reader's digest sprayed silver, she'd kept the lot. I reached for the other box. Marked on the lid was one word, Stacy, my birth mother. I sat back on my heels, my heart thumping. Did I want to open it? Over the years, I'd often pondered on how I should feel about the woman who'd abandoned me on the day I was born. I'd settled on indifference. Perhaps if I'd had a miserable childhood, I'd have hated her. But Nana and Grandpa had been amazing. I definitely hadn't missed out. Biting my lip, I opened the lid of the box, then smiled. It wasn't photos or letters. It was full of childhood decorations too, and funnily enough, that included a cotton wool covered toilet roll tube. After studying the various items, I put my decorations and Stacy's back in the larger cardboard box and pushed it to one side, the first box in my pile for the tip. I lifted the lid on the second cardboard box and took out a large red photo album with my name written across the front in marker pen. Sitting cross-legged, I placed the album in my lap and opened the first page. The caption in Nana's flowing script read, Charlie's First Christmas. She'd clearly made it a Christmas tradition, as there was a double-page spread for the next two decades, stopping when I moved in with Jodie. Each year was represented by five photos, all following roughly the same format. My unopened gifts, obviously taken after Santa had visited on Christmas Eve. Me in my Christmas outfit, me playing with my presents, me with Nana, and me with Grandpa. Returning to the start, I looked through the album again, smiling at the memories of my favourite gifts and shaking my head at presents I'd completely forgotten about. I remembered her taking lots of photos at Christmas, but I'd had no idea the album existed. What an amazing keepsake of all our Christmases together. Thank you, Nana, I whispered, closing the album and stroking my fingers across the cover. I'll definitely keep this. Standing up, I placed it on top of one of the crates of decorations and peered back into the cardboard box. There were old Christmas cards sent to Nana and Grandpa from people I didn't know, odd crackers which had obviously been spare and forgotten about, a box of well-used red candles, recycled gift bows, and another photo album. I lifted out the cream album and blew some dust from the cover. There was no name written on this one, but somehow I knew. It was her album. My mouth felt dry and my hands shook as I opened the first page and read those words. Stacy's First Christmas. The photos were faded, but the format was the same as mine. I stared at the grainy images, trying to spot similarities between my birth mother and me. Twisting round, I grabbed the red album and opened that on the first page too, comparing the images. Did I look like her? I'd never seen a photo of her. 
Nana said she'd been angry with Stacy for leaving and had destroyed the photos she had of her. All she'd tell me was that she had dark hair like me and that she'd worn it long throughout childhood. Nana and Grandpa had both had dark hair, so discovering Stacy was a brunette hadn't been a surprise revelation. I had no idea whether my hazel eyes, easy tan skin and freckles were inherited from her or my father. Nana never talked about Stacy, and although I'd initially been curious, I learned not to ask because it seemed to upset Nana too much. She'd been their only child, and she hadn't just cut herself out of my life. She'd severed ties with them completely too. Studying the albums now, Stacy's early photos were too grainy, but as the years passed and the image quality improved, I could see similarities, but I definitely wasn't the spitting image of her. I'd never know if I looked like my father instead because, according to the spare snippets I'd had from Nana, Stacy hadn't known who he was. I wondered whether Stacy and I were similar in personality at all. We certainly weren't in one respect. I would never abandon a child at birth and disconnect myself completely from my family from that moment. In some ways, I understood why she'd stayed out of my life. But why had she cut off her parents, too? It didn't make sense. Sighing, I closed the albums. As Ricky had pointed out last night, I didn't have a family anymore. And I wished I did. It felt strange being completely alone. I had Jodie, Ricky and Pierre, but it wasn't the same as having Nana and Grandpa. I had no interest in finding Stacy. She'd had 30 years to find me. Not difficult when my grandparents had never moved house, but she hadn't bothered, so why would I want to meet her? To me, she was simply the woman who'd given birth to me. She wasn't my mum. I placed my precious keepsake album back on top of the crates of Christmas decorations and dumped Stacy's on the box of childhood decorations to be thrown out. Then I hesitated, picked it up and placed it on top of mine. I had no idea where Stacy was. I had no way of contacting her and I didn't want to contact her. But that was a special photo album and had to have been important to Nana, given that she created the same thing for my childhood. I had no intention of looking through it again, but it somehow didn't feel right to throw it away. Jody stopped by after summer school finished for the day. She was a teaching assistant at Brockington School, but earned extra money during the summer helping run a summer school for foreign exchange students. The cavalry's here, she announced, hugging me. She removed a bobble from the pocket of her jeans and scraped her long, wavy hair back into a high ponytail. I loved Jodie's hair. It was naturally dark blonde with lighter blonde and honey highlights, giving it a glorious sun-kissed look. My hair was too dark to experiment like that. I'd tried, but blonde streaks didn't suit me, and red tones only lasted a couple of weeks. And I definitely need the cavalry. It's not going well. I led her into the dining room. This is all to go to the tip, she asked, pointing to a pile of crates, boxes and bags at one end. I grimaced and pointed to the opposite end. No, that's the pile to go. Jody looked towards the two cardboard boxes, one containing the childhood Christmas decorations and another with a few broken items and dodgy lampshades that I'd found gathering dust in the attic, and laughed. You weren't kidding when you said you needed my help. What's in the crates you keep in? Christmas decorations? In all of them? I shrugged. Pretty much. Jodie sighed and shook her head. What am I going to do with you? The tears I'd managed to hold back for most of the day found their escape and spilled down my cheeks. I miss them so much, Jodie. Oh, I know you do. She put her arms round me and hugged me. But keeping everything they've ever owned is not going to bring them back. She made me a mug of tea, then led me upstairs and into Nana's bedroom, clutching a roll of bin bags. She fixed her blue eyes on mine. I know it's hard, but it has to be done, she said gently. And we have to be brutal. Is there anything of your Nana's that you could imagine wearing? And if you say any of her flowery nylon dresses, I'll throw this roll of bin bags at you. I thought for a moment. There are a couple of snuggly cardigans which I bought her for Christmas last year and the year before. I love them, but that's about it. Does that sound awful? Of course.
course not. You're 30 and she was 86. I'd be slightly concerned if you did have the same taste in clothes. Jodie ripped two bin bags from the roll while I took the two cardigans out of Nana's drawers. She billowed out one and handed it to me. We'll bag everything else up, everything. You take the wardrobe and I'll take the drawers. The easiest way to do this is to just systematically fill the bags as quickly as possible. Don't pause to look and remember, because that will just break your heart. She was right. Doing it quickly was better, like ripping off a plaster. But my heart still broke into a thousand pieces.